What's happening, people? Anyone here? I don't think this tells me who's on. One person. I don't know why I make these live videos. It's like you get like 15 people to watch. Oh, you guys have any questions you want to talk about? Hi, Kathy. Hi, Kathleen. What do you guys want to talk about with a nice fall morning? There's always this awkward phase when you start a video so that you are waiting for people to come on. Like, you guys don't matter enough for me to talk to. I need a bigger audience. You guys are meaningless. No, I'm just kidding. <sighs> Kathleen says, all your videos are a blessing. Thanks. I've been making some new videos. Um, I have a new video up. Actually, a couple new videos up about our ATCs. Our ATC uh, RVs. I've got uh, three new videos about those. You guys want to check that out? This is coffee, so it's like a two-way conversation. So you guys got to ask me stuff. Maybe I should change the title to Ask Your Questions, something like that. I had way too much energy for my family this morning at, like, waking up and having coffee. So they kicked me out, and I had to go talk to you guys. Mm. Ah, it's really important to get good quality food. A lot of you guys might think that you don't tolerate coffee, but if you get the right kind of coffee, it's actually good for you and you'll tolerate it. You just can't drink moldy coffee. And ironically, the cream that I do the best with is this Walmart Great Value Heavy Whipping Cream. I think that if you... By half and half, it's a lot worse because there's something about the milk. But you often will find that foods that feel good to you, that you don't react to, that keep you in a healing state, are not the ones you would expect. Who knows why this garbage Walmart brand is good and is clean? I don't really know. But we don't always ask why with mold avoidance. We just do what we do. It's practical. Sorry, my wife says I'm a loud coffee drinker. Are you feeling the slump? What do you mean, Kathleen? What kind of slump? Be specific. I have a lot of slumps in my life right now. Like the fact that... Actually, I can't really think of any. <laughs> Not too many slumps. You guys have any questions? Who's drink, what kind of coffee are you guys drinking? So, last night I made a, a new podcast episode. I have had, um, I have a lot of friends now that are experienced mold avoiders who have been doing mold avoidance for like three, four, five, six, seven years. And they won't come on my podcast. They're like, no, I don't want to come on. So last night I made a podcast where I just mentioned some things that I've learned from them. So if you guys want to hear what experienced mold avoiders talk about, me being one of the least experienced of that group, then jump on to my podcast. I just made it last night. I guess I should button up my button here. It's a little too casual. Uh, the Eric seasonal slump, Kathleen. Yes, definitely. Eric once said to me that mold avoidance skills are more important in the November season. And that was an interesting way to phrase it. By the way, can you guys hear me okay? Mold avoidance skills are more important in November. And there was a lot, you know, when Eric says something, there's usually a lot of wisdom to unpack with what he says. And I thought there was a lot of wisdom in that. 
because he didn't say this is the time of the year where there's a slump or this is the time of the year where you feel bad or this is the time of year where you're in bed. Maybe that's for non-mold avoiders, but for mold avoiders, he said, this is the time of year when you really have to test your mold avoidance skills. Why, why that's interesting to me and what that told me is that you actually don't have to feel bad this time of year if you are extra vigilant about your mold avoidance skills. That has very much been my experience. You don't have to feel bad this time of year. So let me ask you guys who say uh, no coffee. Um, why don't you drink coffee? Is it A, because of a theoretical reason, like I think coffee is bad for me? Or is it B, because it makes you feel bad? Would you guys tell me you don't drink coffee because A, theoretically it's bad, or B, it actually makes me feel bad? What do people say to that? A, theoretically it's bad, or B, it makes me feel bad. So while you guys are answering, okay, so caffeine gives me heart palps. My feeling is that you a person's ability to tolerate coffee is a good indication of their health and how clear they are. Um, early on, when I was a lot sicker and less clear, I would only have small windows of being able to tolerate coffee. But let me preface that by saying that, um, Audrey, I would love to send you a link to good coffee because in order for this conversation to even have any meaning at all, um, we have to be talking about clear coffee. Because if you get coffee that's toxic or moldy, it's going to make everybody feel bad. So if you guys want to test your true tolerance for clear coffee without toxins in it, I want you to buy Bulletproof brand French Kick coffee. Bulletproof French Kick pre-ground coffee. Now, I don't make any money from Bulletproof, and I'm not even saying that's the only one that they sell that's clear. But that's the one that I feel is clear and that I'm drinking right now. And if you go order that, Bulletproof French Kick, uh, Bulletproof French Kick coffee, then tell me if you tolerate coffee or not, okay? Because I feel, and I think Eric agrees with me because he drinks a lot of coffee, that if you're clear enough, coffee actually is really good for you and it gets detox going and it get, it stimulates glutathione production in your cells and it, it sells and it's very, very good for you. Um, and I feel way better when I drink coffee and I don't get jitters and I don't get issues because it's not moldy coffee, number one. Um, this is the way a lot of things are with mold illness where the things that are potentially good for you actually make you feel bad early on. There are many examples of this. Um, fermented foods is one of them. A lot of the mold doctors tell people to avoid fermented foods. But then later on, fermented foods are good for you. I think coffee is the same thing. I actually think coffee is very good for you. And that red wine is very good for you if it's not toxic. And that there's a reason that Americans like coffee and red wine. And it's not because they're stupid. It's because they're actually good for you. More of a taste preference? Yeah, I mean, but I, I don't know. I would, Kathleen, I would be curious to see how coffee makes you feel. Because generally, the things that taste good and bad to us are based on how they make us feel. So, if coffee doesn't taste good to you, it might be because it doesn't make you feel good. That would be my contention. So, uh, yeah, the fall slump, um, the toxins are definitely meaner this time of year. They are definitely meaner. And you have to put your mold avoidance skills to the test. And like I said, it's fascinating to me that Eric never said this is the time of year where you're doomed to feel bad. He said this is the time of year where you really have to put your mold avoidance skills to the test. All right. Anyone have any other questions? I'm almost done with my cup of coffee. We're running out of time here. 
<clears throat> I do think that dark chocolate is similar to coffee in some ways in that it has a hormetic effect on the body and causes the body to detox. So that's probably why mold avoiders like dark chocolate as well as coffee. How are you doing these days, Audrey? Are you still with us? I haven't talked to you in a while. Yeah, Kathleen, Eric used to call it suicide season. I, I know that. And I agree with that. But there's a difference between people who are pursuing mold avoidance and people who are not. I think that Eric would also tell you that during this time of year, November, suicide season, whatever you want to call it, that if he went to a clear desert, he would feel great, whether it was a full moon or whether it was November. So again, the reason it's suicide season is because of the mold toxins being particularly bad this time of year. So if you can do better mold avoidance, then it's not suicide season. Do you see what I'm saying? It's, it's, it's like a war. You know, when you're in a war and there's an enemy shooting bullets at you, guns are very, are more dangerous than they are when they're in your closet, right? When you're in a war, guns are not in the closet. They're not in storage. They're being fired at you. So they're more dangerous. That's kind of how mold toxins are in the winter, I think. But if you can avoid the bullets, then you won't get hurt. It's harder to avoid bullets in a war than it is in peacetime because people are shooting bullets at you. So that's a super important point. People, this is the time of year where you really have to fight hard to avoid mold and to do the things that are healthy and helpful for mold avoidance. This time of year is not just about avoiding mold, okay? It's also about decontaminating more thoroughly and showering more often and avoiding foods that make you sick. It's, it's about all kinds of things that are helpful, but especially mold avoidance. Audrey just asked, how do I feel in the casita versus the ATC? It's funny that you asked that, Audrey, because there's not a human on earth that goes back and forth from a casita to an ATC more than me, because it's like our house. This is like my office and my bedroom, and the ATC is where my family is and like the family room. So I'm back and forth between the casita and the ATC 150 times a day. So I can definitely answer that question for you. Um, I would say that they both feel very clear mold wise, but the ATC feels better to me. And I think it's because of the Faraday cage effect that you actually pointed out, Audrey, how the ATC blocks EMF. <clears throat> and I'm going to tell you guys something that's super fascinating about this. Let me just back up for a minute. One of the premises I think that's really important with mold avoidance is that we just accept the rules of the game how they are without trying to always explain it and understand it and be some crazy scientist that wins a Nobel Prize. I'll tell you something weird. In the ATC, we use Wi-Fi. Now, it's not a super strong Wi-Fi. It's a, I use my computer as a Wi-Fi router, so it's a little weaker. But we use Wi-Fi. We use five cell phones. We use two smart TVs, and two laptops all at the same time. That's crazy. I have zero problems with EMF in that ATC. Zero. So whatever it's blocking on the outside, whatever radio waves or TV waves or whatever, to make it feel better in there than outside, it see, that seems to be a lot more important and damaging than all of our little gadgets inside people are going to squawk about that and they're going to say that's impossible because you shouldn't be using wi-fi you shouldn't be using this inside the trailer bull what do you mean i shouldn't be based on what based on your nobel prize winning science that you now are, are the expert you guys we don't understand a lot of this stuff getting well from mold avoidance means that we do what feels good even though we don't understand it so again we use all of our devices inside the ATC, and I don't feel any different in there. Um, I do think that Eric is right that mold brings on a, uh, EMF reactivity. Um, but that's not totally true because I feel better in the ATC, even though there's no mold in our outdoor air. But there might be a little bit of mold. So to answer a question, uh, Audrey, 
Um, both the ATC and the Casita are totally fine for me. I'm totally satisfied. I've got no complaints. They're great. Um, I sleep in the Casita, no, no issues. But the, the ATC feels a tiny bit better to me because of that. But yeah, it's kind of weird, right? That like I can do um, all the EMF. Like I'm not, I wouldn't sit there and suffer, you guys. Like if the EMF bothered me in the ATC, I would be like, turn it off. In fact, when I we used to be really EMF sensitive, I used to make my family turn off uh, their devices. And so, um, sorry, I'm going to just tell this phone call here that I can't talk. Um, I used to make my family turn off their devices when I was really EMF sensitive. So it's not like I'm just like grinning and bearing it, you know. Um, I I don't feel it in there at all when all those devices are on. It just doesn't matter. So it's probably a combination of the ATC having zero mold in it right now. I think there's zero mold in my ATC. And the fact that it's blocking the more important EMF, that more important EMF, is probably the outside EMF that maybe even sensitizes us to additional EMF. Who knows? Who knows? I am so burned out on theoretical questions. And I don't get me wrong. I don't think that nobody should ask the theoretical questions. Like if there's scientists out there who want to ask all these questions and they have the tools in the laboratory, more power to them. But I'm not that guy and you're not that guy. Unless there's someone hiding in our audience who's a scientist that I don't know about. So Please, let's not talk about why this is the way it is. It just doesn't matter. All right, moving on. Um, I was doing really well up until my dog got sick. The vet hospital did not act properly and allowed her. She is a 50% fatality. Take care of her challenge reserves. Oh, I'm so sorry to hear about that. I know what it is to have animal stress. I had a dog that I really loved that died right as I was getting super sick with mold illness. And I do think it affected me. I don't think it was really a major thing, but um, the stress challenge, my mitochondria and feel now after doing really, really well and the best I have ever felt in years. Okay, well, thanks for sharing your story. Um, the stress challenged my mitochondria and I feel it now after doing really, really well. So you're not doing as well. Well, Kathleen, it would be interesting to see how you did with the mold sabbatical. I'm like obsessed with mold sabbaticals. You know what I mean? All right, guys, ask me more questions. You gotta keep me talking here, or else I'm gonna go play with my dog. But again, I really would like you guys to try this kind of coffee. If you don't drink coffee, get the Bulletproof French Kick pre-ground coffee and see how you feel drinking it. What other questions do you guys have? You could ask me anything. You could ask me what the ATC is made out of. You could ask me how the roof is doing on the ATC. You could ask me if there's even hidden wood in the roof of the ATC that they didn't tell me about. Uh -huh. So one of the things that I wanna to try to do in the next couple of weeks is to um, get um, my podcast organized into a here i'm going to close my window i'll be right back uh, i want to get my podcast organized into more of like a, a logical order for where people should start because there's like 55 episodes of my podcast now which is like way too many People can't just like start anywhere on there. Okay, Audrey says, I went to Mount Charleston for the first time last week and it was awesome. That's really good to hear, Audrey, that Mount Charleston is still awesome because there was just a huge fire retardant drop there. There's pictures of it in the news. Um, so that's great to hear that um, it's still good. Or maybe the frat hasn't developed yet. Or maybe you're not sensitive to frat. But I used to really like Mount Charleston. Um, now, Mount Charleston never triggered that super deep healing and detox that New Mexico did for me. But maybe some people who are less sick don't need New Mexico. It's very relative. I definitely think that's cool to hear your report on Mount Charleston. I think Mount Charleston is a great place for mold avoiders to go right now because um, 
people are looking for places to go for the winter. And Mount Charleston does get very cold, that is true, but you have Las Vegas right nearby. You have a lot of warm desert areas right nearby. Um, Mount Charleston would be a great, great spot for people to check out right now. It's not as cold as other places. Um, is there hidden wood in the ATC? All right, Audrey, that's a great question. I got lucky. I think I already told you about this, but I'm just going to talk about it anyway. I'm looking at my phone right now to find the picture, but I got lucky. Apparently, some of the ATCs are still built with craft paper in the attic backing the uh, fiberglass batting insulation. So the first thing I did when I got my ATC is I panicked and I took out one of the speakers and I stuck my fingers through the insulation to the aluminum one piece ceiling to see if my insulation had uh, paper. And thank God it did not. Um, so I got lucky because I never knew to ask for that. But if you are planning on buying an ATC, um, make sure you ask that call the manufacturer directly with a VIN number and make sure you ask if, if it has the craft paper backing. I think, Audrey, that there is no wood or cardboard or paper anywhere else in the ATC. Zero. I, I suppose it's possible that the refrigerator might have some because sometimes the insulation on the walls of refrigerators uses cardboard. Um, but I do not know of any uh, other places where there might be wood or cardboard. One of the things I love about the ATC, which also makes it less good for cold weather, is that there are really no hidden areas. Of course, the walls are hidden. You can't really see inside the walls, but you can see pictures of them assembling it at the factory. There's just not a lot of places for them to hide paper and wood and stuff. I love the ATC. I love the ATC more with every day. I love the ATC so much that I have relationships now with a couple of dealers that you can contact me and I'll help put you in touch with a dealer that understands our needs and helping people order. Um, I love the ATCs. I just love them. I'm probably going to sell 100 ATCs for people and not even make any money off of it or maybe make a little bit of money, I hope, but I doubt it. Um, okay. I have a question. I've been reacting to areas of the grocery store that didn't use to react to before, like dental products and cleaning products. Some stores that I didn't react to before. Not sure if this is a good sign. Okay, so Carol, um, if you read the, the, the literature, you will see that when you get clear enough of problematic mold, um, you go into what's called intensification. And intensification is when not only mold feels worse to you and more intense, but a lot of things feel worse and more intense, including chemicals essential oils, fragrances, gasoline, all of that stuff gets more intense. Now, here's what's important. If you learn how to distinguish the problematic causative toxins like MT and FRAT, and you get away from those, even while you're reacting to everything else, oh no, this guy is falling, I react to everything, and you get away from those long enough, then your reactivity to all of the stuff will go back down to normal. If you don't get away, from all from the, the couple of really important toxins, if you think all toxins are equal and you spend your life avoiding dishwasher detergent, you'll never get better. And I have proof of this. You guys talk to, I'm not gonna name her because she didn't give me permission to name her in this video, but there's a girl in our group who spent years in San Diego and she reacted to everything and was very sick and she never really believed me about MT being the cause of this. And finally, she's been messaging me she uh, went to Florida and not, not that Florida is great, but again, it might be better in San Diego. And she's like, oh yeah, I, I got off the plane in Florida and I don't react to chemicals anymore. I'm like, oh really? Do you think they have different brands in Florida? Like all of a sudden, like different distributor? No, she's like, no, it's the same stuff. I just don't react to it anymore. Hmm. Very important clue. That's the whole premise of what Eric discovered. Like that's like the meat. All right. We did the appetizer. We did the wine. We did the hors d'oeuvres, like the steak, the steak of Eric's style mold avoidance, the meat, is that there are a few really, 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 really important toxins and nothing else really matters at all. And if you can just avoid those really important toxins, then you get your life back and you can drink coffee again and you can drink alcohol again, okay? That's the basis of what we're talking about, Carol. So that is a really good question and it's the most important question. Lyme disease, MECFS, uh, chemical sensitivity, all this stuff has at its root these very important toxins. Now, I'm not saying that genetics don't play a role or whatever, like, sure. But in terms of 
practical. What can we do as middle-aged adults who are already messed up by our genetics and environment? What can we do, right? I'm not saying like, like what's the all-knowing omniscient answer. I'm just saying, what can we do? So you guys rewind that. If you're just tuning in right now and you didn't hear what I said, then listen to the video when it's done. I have seen a video with leaking spots on the ATC. Sonia, have you ever experienced that? My feeling is that yes, the ATCs are leak prone. I think my ATC will leak. Um, I've heard a lot of people talk about leaks. Now, this gets into kind of an interesting discussion because if you don't want to have leaks in your RV or your house, you have a couple of options to not have leaks in your RV in your house. The first option is you can be wealthy and you can hire a extremely proficient engineer and home builder to build you an impossibly good house. Okay, none of us can do that, so let's just check that off the list, all right? The second option is you can live in a non-living space structure that isn't really intended to be lived in, like a cargo trailer, all right? Um, I tried that, and it didn't work with the family. It was too, It was too rough and too primitive, although for a long time I was a perfectionist, and I tried to make it work, and it cost me a lot of money. The third, oh, the, well, I'll say the other, I'll say another option before I say the last one, but the other option is you can do what we all know one of the members in our group does, which is to live in a canvas tent, a structure so simple with one single fabric wall that there's nothing to leak or nowhere to hide. Ultimately, I decided that I was not going to be able to avoid mold perfectly, and the ATC, even if it leaks, I'm taking a gamble that it probably will not develop problematic mold because there's no cellulose for it to grow on. Um, I just don't think mold can get all that bad without having wood or cardboard or something to eat. I have a precedent for this. I have owned my new truck now for three years since starting mold avoidance, and I've had my truck in some very humid areas, and my truck has been very wet and rained and everything, and my truck has never grown problematic mold. It probably is a little moldy in my truck, but I could live in my truck if I had to. See, I always tell my daughter um, when she's doing her schoolwork, she's a bit of a perfectionist, and I always tell her, perfect is the enemy of good. Perfect is the enemy of good. You cannot have perfect housing unless you run around naked and freeze your ass off. And I think it was somebody, maybe it was even you, Sonia, who said that you were very tired from living in... Um, uh, living, not having comfortable housing. And I know exactly what that feels like because I spent the entire summer of 2018 living in my truck. Um, I did have an, a contaminated RV that I would go in uh, a couple times a day, but I would literally like just dart inside, get something out of the refrigerator and then run back out. So I spent an entire summer living out of my truck, which really means living outside because a truck is not comfortable enough to live in. You can't spend any meaningful amount of time in a truck. I don't care what anybody says. You sit in a truck for 30, 40 minutes and you're done, you get out. So really I spent that total time living outside. The second thing I would say about ATCs being leaky is that I think there's a lot of prudence and value in living in a dry, arid climate. Now I got, you know, Eric and a lot of people have said that humidity doesn't matter and you can have pristine air anywhere. And I found that to be true. On my scouting trip this summer, when I was looking for a place for us to land, I went to Oklahoma and it was very humid there, at least very humid for me, 50, 60, 70% humidity. And it was true. There were pristine areas there. I would walk around in this jungle of dripping water and moisture and it felt great to me. It was totally pristine. But the problem is you can't keep housing as good in humid areas. At least I couldn't. Um, I, there was just way too much mold growing on everything in Oklahoma. My clothing was getting moldy just from wearing it around in the day. So I learned a very important lesson there, which is that it is a priority for me to keep my housing as good as possible. And so we ended up buying a two acre parcel in Utah where um, it is very dry and temperate and moderate. And I think it's going to help me keep the ATC good. Because even if it rains and even if the window leaks a little bit or whatever, I can spend an hour or two a day in the afternoon, even in the wintertime where it's 40 or 50 degrees and the sun is out, keep all the fans on and let it dry out. I just don't think there's another way, you guys. I don't think so. I think 
conventional buildings, whether they be RVs, houses, they're going to leak because the people who assemble them don't care about mold. It's reality. This year is all about reality for me. Last year, the theme of last year was perfectionism. I want to do perfect mold avoidance. Perfect. But it backfired big time. And I got myself into a lot of trouble financially and uh, a lot of other ways by trying to have perfect housing. So I have traded perfect for good enough. One example is my property that we're on right now has a four car cinder block garage with a wood roof. The wood is open trust, so I don't think a lot of mold will grow, but the perfectionist in me said, I don't want any wood at all. But I'm really glad we bought this property because combined with a dry climate, I don't think it's gonna get moldy and it hasn't yet. Perfect mold avoidance is bad. Don't do perfect mold avoidance because what you'll do if you do perfect mold avoidance is you won't be doing mold avoidance because you'll burn out and spend all your money and you will have nothing left. That is the most important lesson I can share with you guys. I also don't think that if the ATC leaks that it will grow bad mold. I just don't. But mold doesn't eat plastic and metal. Like it can eat plastic, it can even eat nuclear radiation. Like I'm not saying that can't happen. I just am not convinced. I don't think it'll go problem out of mold. Now there's a different, you have to learn. There's a difference between reacting to mold and getting sick from mold. I've had little bits of mold that like we rented a house last summer in, in Northern New Mexico. And when we got into the house, the guy had used old reused wood cabinets that were moldy and they had surface mold on it and I could see it. And anytime it rained or it was humid, that surface mold would pump out mycotoxins and it was a little bit moldy, but it wasn't problematic mold. Even though I reacted to it, problematic mold, you, you got to distinguish reactions. Okay. Later, when I, when, when, when that house developed a really bad roof leak and the mold inside the walls, deep in the walls, started to grow and the house got really moldy, then I couldn't even be near the house. So again, I don't think that a little bit of mold is the enemy. I, uh, my casita right now over this way, oops, uh, over this way, there is mold in the bathroom right now that I don't even bother to care about. It's just surface mold. Um, a very wise mentor who you guys know of told me once that um, surface mold is not the enemy. And I think she was right. So, you know, I, 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 I ended up being separated from my family for nine months of the last year because we didn't have a shelter plan and they were in a moldy house that I couldn't tolerate. And so I just had to really face reality with this stuff, you guys. Like we needed a place to live and it couldn't be perfect. And the, the ATC and the Casita have a lot better resale value than my Frankenstein custom trailer. By the way, my custom trailer is for sale. I spent about $43,000 building that thing and I'm selling it for, I don't know, 15 or 20,000. So I'm gonna take a huge loss on it and I haven't even gotten any offers on it yet. Um. I think it's a great unit. Like if you want to do perfect mold avoidance, buy my custom trailer. It was built with the Eric style principles. There's no glue and adhesive in the whole freaking thing. It's exactly like Eric's unit. I shouldn't say exactly. Eric's smarter and better and whatever, but um, it's as close as I could get to Eric's unit. You want to do perfect mold avoidance? You're a single person. You don't have kids. You're ready for a project. Buy my custom trailer. I'll make you a good deal on it. But I just didn't work for us. Um, we, we needed something that was built to be lived in. This is what I talk about in a podcast that I did a couple of weeks ago about uh, how um, RV and housing technology has had decades and hundreds of years to mature to where it is. Like this RV that I'm sitting in right now, like it's a living space. Somebody, a company that has employees and engineers designed this space. And it just came to a point where my family needed a real living space to be in without having a Frankenstein RV. Um, now, if I was single, a single person, by the way, this RV that I'm in right now, the Casita, I could live in this for the rest of my life. No complaints. Some people are like, oh, it's too small. I love it. Of course, I can't because I have a family. But if like I was like one or two people, I think the Casita is fantastic. I, I love it in here. I would live in here. No complaints for the rest of my life. And I would have no bills. Finances would be a lot easier. All right. Going back to questions here. For people new to towing a trailer, do you just learn through trial and error? Should I look for some type of driving class backing up? Yeah, no, uh, yeah, I, I, uh, I'm a pilot, 
I have my private pilot license and I have about 150 hours flying an airplane. I owned a boat, uh, which I had to pull a boat trailer. I would not say I'm a particularly mechanical person. I can't build stuff, but I do. I did learn uh, how to tow things. Now, okay, Paul, you asked about towing a trailer. What I would start to do is just get lost on YouTube in normal people videos. Do a YouTube search how to tow an RV and watch 10 videos. Take some notes, what's important, so you remember later. Then do another YouTube video. Um, problems towing a trailer, take some notes. Then do another YouTube video. How to set up your RV at an RV park. And it'll tell you about what to unhook first and how to level the wheels and, and then do another video. I actually wanna make some videos on this, how to empty RV tanks. Why do we empty the black tank before the gray tank? and write some notes. Now, here's the problem with towing an RV. It is not hard. It is that mold illness makes your brain not be able to learn. And so learning anything new is hard with mold illness. It's not that pulling a trailer is hard. It's that you can't learn. So we know it's going to take us a lot longer to learn something new because we're mold illness patients. Thankfully, that's over with. I was just talking to um, about how like now I, I like built my kids a trampoline and I just got out the instructions and I was just like, because my brain works again. But when I, my brain didn't work. So you need to think about pulling an RV as being a new thing that you learn. Think of it as a college degree. You need to get a college degree in pulling a trailer. You need to give yourself plenty of time. You need to learn. You need to take notes. You need to go through it in your mind. Okay, first I'm going to hook up the ball and then I'm going to hook up the weight distribution hitch. It's just learning. And since we learn slower when you have mold illness, you need to give yourself extra time for learning. Now, I do have a podcast on catastrophic mistakes that are made by new RV owners in terms of mold avoidance, meaning that um, these mistakes are more important to you because you're a mold avoider and they're related to growing mold in your RV. Listen to my podcast, <clears throat> Avoiding Catastrophic Mistakes. So there's two parts to learn. There's one, how do I pull a trailer and set it up just like a normal person would? Like Billy Bob, Mr. just bought a new camping trailer and learning how to use it. And the second thing is, what do I have to pay special attention to because I'm a mold avoider? Have you suffered from cross-contamination in your casita? And if yes, how did you take care of it? I gotta think about that for a minute. Have you suffered from cross-contamination? I'm just thinking about this. Um, So I believe that I have healed to the point where I don't really need to worry about cross-contamination too much. Um, I took my casita on a 10,000 mile road trip this summer. 10,000 miles, not exaggerating. I went to eight different states and a couple of states multiple times. Don't you think that I probably ran into some bad toxins on that trip? Like, wouldn't I have? I mean, I went through a lot of places. And some of them, some of them hit me so badly that I had to decontaminate right away. But yet my casita never felt bad to me ever. And it still doesn't. So you be the judge. Does that mean that miraculously somehow um, the carpet no longer absorbs toxins? No, I think my body maybe is different. So I would focus on uh, healing yourself to the point where you don't react as much to cross-contamination. Um, but yes, I am careful with the casita and I try not to take it and leave it and let it sit in really bad areas. And I try not to bring bad items inside, but I don't really worry about cross-contamination too much anymore, except in my sleeping bag and my clothing. I kind of hit this point in my healing where cross-contamination in my environment doesn't even really bother me that much. Like I'm looking around now and there's a few things in here that have HT and I just don't feel it anymore unless I'm touching it. And even if I am touching it, I only feel it for a few minutes. So I really think people should make a super effort. Hey, Sonia, have you ever spent time in New Mexico, northern New Mexico around Taos? Because I think that spending a year and a half in Taos healed me at a very deep core level. And that that was more important than doing extreme mold avoidance in terms of cross-contamination. This is something that if you guys listen to my podcast from last night about what it's like to talk to experienced mold avoiders, that's one of the things that I bring up is that the focus shifts away from cross-contamination. Not in all cases, there's sometimes really bad cross-contamination, but it shifts more toward um, location 
Am I in a location that will sustain and continue to heal me? If you are fighting with cross-contamination all the time, I question your location, or you have some sort of a detox blockage that is not allowing you to make progress, like parasites, heavy metals, things like that. Um, parasite treatment did lower my reactivity a lot. But I don't bring that up a lot to people because then they're like, oh, I can just do parasite treatment instead of mold avoidance. No, no, no. Parasite treatment only worked for me after two years of very extreme mold avoidance. But um, Lisa did tell me that she would bring like a wet vac, like a vacuum, you know, one of those wet vacs, to vacuum the carpet walls in her casita. Um, but no, I have not had problems with now. Now don't now you guys are gonna say, oh well, see Brian's different than me. He doesn't react to cross contamination, um, and so he's not like me. That's not true. We got rid of two full RVs and everything in them, about twenty five thousand dollars between trading both of those in and clothing for five people because of cross contamination. We spent one night in a bad location, in very early avoidance. One night. And it ruined my new RV so badly that I couldn't even spend time in it and I had to get rid of it. And believe it or not, are you guys ready for this? You guys won't believe this. I had my truck up for sale on Craigslist after one night in a bad location. I had someone come to look at my truck the day after I put it up on Craigslist. And for three months, I could not tolerate my truck. I would rather die. Freaking kill me rather than be in that truck. And when I would move the visor down on the sun on my you know, mold, mold would come out months later and I would, I drove it up and down Mount Lemon in Tucson. Of course, hint, hint, Tucson. <laughs> Maybe that's why it was so contaminated. Hmm. I wonder. Um, I drove my truck up and down uh, Mount Lemon in Tucson 50 times. Ozone, wash, clean. Ozone, wash, clean. Ozone, wash, clean. Get gas. Ozone, wash, clean. Up and down, up and down because elevation was supposed to decontaminate, right? So it's not that I never reacted to cross-contamination. No. I got rid of two RVs because of cross-contamination. One night of cross-contamination the first time. The second time was a, a hell toxin explosion, which I do think really happened, but I don't think that could happen to me anymore. So I think that if you still react to cross-contamination, then you should buy the casita because it's relatively warm. You can keep it warm in the winter and use the casita to take yourself to New Mexico and live in a good location for a long time. That's my opinion on that. Might not be popular, but that's what I think. According to AC owners group, that's a pretty common issue and is easily addressed. Audrey, what are we talking about here? What is a common issue? The windows leaking? I would like to know what you mean. Great, I just got approved in the group. Okay. Um, bulletproof coffee is great. Literally brewing a cup right now. Yeah, so um, again, I, I, I talked, if you, this video will be up, uh, you can watch it when it's, when it's done, but we were talking earlier about coffee and I think coffee is one of the foods that actually is good for you, but it feels bad when you're too mold toxic and bulletproof coffee is good. And the French kick type of bulletproof coffee is the best to me. And so I'm curious to know if people try that, what they think. So yeah, Sonia, I do agree with you. The ATC would be easier to clean. I don't know if that's totally true because the Freedom Express, I don't think RVs are easy to clean. I don't actually think that's true because the ATC still has lots of duct work for the air conditioner and the furnace, and it still has lots of cabinets, and it still has... Um, no, but you're right. It would be easier to clean than a lot of other RVs. Our Freedom Express, when it got contaminated, I spent months trying to clean that thing so that we wouldn't have to trade it in. Both of them, both times, I spent months trying to clean them months, two to three months each time. And of course I had to trade them in anyway. My cleaning was totally unsuccessful. I was just too reactive. But the the walls in the ATC and the ceiling are made out of plastic, Asdel, which is plastic. And I think they would uh, absorb mold toxins and I don't think you could get it out very easily. Um, I think it would just have to die down over time. Uh, Sonia, where do you live? Like, uh, you don't have to tell us exactly where you live, but like, do you live in a good location, a bad location? Do you live in Tucson? Um, I am telling you guys, <clears throat> after I did mold avoidance for 18 months, no, 12 months, I kind of plateaued. Even though I was living in my truck, even though I was living in the middle of the desert, 
even though I was living outside, I plateaued, all right? Because I wasn't in a good location. I was in Reno, Reno, Nevada, which I went back to this summer and it sucked when I was more unmasked. I left Reno November 2018 and I went down to Anaheim where the ocean air is. The ocean air is a Band-Aid, makes you feel better temporarily, but doesn't cause deep healing. I went down to Reno, Nevada, or I went down to Anaheim from Reno. My family met me down there after they gave up their lease on the apartment. We had been living apart for six months. And after we left Anaheim, it was getting cold in Reno. We were living in a Freedom Express RV, so we couldn't go back to the mountains for the cold winter. And I went to Arizona and I still wasn't getting better. And then Simca said, come to New Mexico. And I was like, what do you mean, bro? I've already been to New Mexico. It was no different for me than Arizona because I wasn't ready for it yet. So I went into New Mexico and magic started to happen. Magic started to happen in New Mexico. Now, I had already traveled 30,000 miles and hadn't had the magic yet. So there was something special about New Mexico. So I went to New Mexico after Arizona, after we had left Reno, after 12 months of mold avoidance. And when I went to City of Rocks, which is a state park in New Mexico, I had already been there before. It didn't do this to me the first time. And now there's some reports, people saying it's not so great, but whatever. I went to City of Rocks and magic started to happen after 12 months of avoidance, after living in my car all summer, not going in buildings. None of that stuff worked. New Mexico worked. I went to City of Rocks in New Mexico and crap started coming out of me. My skin started getting oily and greasy and I had to take a shower every 20 minutes. And the water there, I couldn't tolerate the water so I couldn't even shower there. It was intensification, it's too intense. There's no water, I gotta shower, whatever. But when I went to City of Rocks after, no, this was 15 months into avoidance. 15 months into avoidance, I went to City of Rocks and magic started to happen there. And then, now this is key. I want you guys to listen to this. This is so important. After that, I went to Ghost Ranch, which is in northern New Mexico in Abiquiu. Ghost Ranch has MT. I don't recommend it as a location. And our RV was contaminated. But do you guys want to know what? The, the, the air in New Mexico was so healing to me. That even though Ghost Ranch had MT, and even though our RV was cross-contaminated, Sonia, the magic kept going. Magic, 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 detox, 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 crap coming out of me, having to shower every hour. Oh, and the water at Ghost Ranch was really good. So that's why I wish you guys understood how important location is, because let's contrast the two. Even in Reno, where I was living outside, showering all the time, living in my truck, not going in buildings, living in the desert, riding my mountain bike dozens and dozens of miles, um, sweating in the sun, nothing, no benefit. Plateau, 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 plateau. But in New Mexico, I was living in a contaminated RV. I was in MT at Ghost Ranch. I was, you know, all kinds of crap was happening. And you know what? Magic, magic, magic. Bottom line, location, 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 location. Forget about cross-contamination. Forget about all that stuff. Location, location, location. That is what leads to healing in this illness. When we lived in Taos for a year and a half, um, because the location was good, cross-contamination and going in buildings, none of it mattered. My healing went like this. And... After, I couldn't leave New Mexico for a year and a half. I would leave and go back. Leave and go back. I would get all bold. I'm leaving New Mexico. I don't like this place. Oh, look at me. I'm awesome. See you later, New Mexico. Two weeks later, I'd be back. Something magical happened in that location. Not, not because I figured out a new way to manage cross-contamination. Not because I was invo- avoiding MT perfectly. <clears throat> But some locations are good and some locations are bad, right? It's the locations effect. So after a year and a half, I was like, well, crap. This sucks. I'm stuck in New Mexico. I can never go anywhere for the rest of my life. I'm stuck here, right? But that's actually not what happened. My intensification seemed to die down after a year and a half, which was two and a half years into mold avoidance. And then I left New Mexico 
And I was totally fine. I could go anywhere. I, I still couldn't go into bad cities and stuff. I didn't want to spend time in Frat and MT. Those still destroyed me. But all of a sudden, I didn't need New Mexico anymore. And miraculously, at the same time, I started to not react to cross-contamination as badly. And, and a lot of other things got better. And I could drink coffee and all this stuff. So it's so simple, you guys. It just goes back to what Eric has been saying for 30 years. Eric said to me, that after he would go to Truckee and he would get a bad mold hit, he had to do three months of desert time in a good location. Now, that was 30 years ago. Maybe the desert in Reno that I didn't do good in was better back then. I don't know. Whatever. We don't always know the answer. But the thing that Eric did to heal was to change locations, right? His MECU, his, his, he calls his RV his MECU, Mobile Environmental Containment Unit. It was mobile. He moved. He moved. He didn't sit in his house and scrub stuff. Yeah, sure, he decontaminated and he was very aware of contamination. I'm not saying that. But the thing that he did to heal was he moved. He moved his body somewhere else. That's why mold avoidance is so hard. That's why people don't do mold avoidance because they hear about the moving part and they're like, oh, yeah, well, I couldn't do that. <laughs> yeah, you can. Just get a little sicker, buddy. Get a little sicker and we'll see what you can do. You know, it's like my dog who says, I'll pee in the trailer. And then I like, you know, discipline her. No, I don't abuse her. I don't hurt her. But I'm like, Lexi, no. And now she's like, okay, I won't be in the trailer. Like, so like, just get a little bit sicker and you can move. Trust me. Just do it sooner than later. All right. You guys are getting me on my caffeine buzz here. All right. Um, what else do we do? See you, Audrey. Have a great weekend. Uh, so anyone else have any other questions before I sign off here? I'm going to answer um, your question. Now, I don't know how to pronounce your name. Jian Lu, Lao? Jian Lao? Jean Lao? Um, I'll answer your question, but if you guys have any other questions, please type them in now because I'm going to sign off in a minute. That is a great question. Now that you are in a good location, would you ever consider normal housing or is the ATC for the foreseeable future? That is such a great question because the answer to that question is something that I would have never expected. What I learned about conventional housing and my choice to live in a wood-free environment is something that I would never have expected the answer to be. So the answer is that the problem with that I found with wood housing was that it wasn't long-term reliable enough for me. So in other words, I would find a house, and there are good houses. There's great houses. There's, there's conventional housing that I could live in, that I could do just fine in. I've lived in two houses uh, since doing mold avoidance, and I've done fine. The problem is that you're always one disaster or water leak away from having to move. And I just couldn't do that with my family anymore. Like we just, my, my marriage, my relationship with my kids, my family was, a, my finances, my bank account, everything was about to explode from all this moving. And you talk to people who say, um, we've moved 20 times, right? Like we had moved we a bunch of times. and. So I had to do something different. I had to do something different because it wasn't working. Um, if you guys ever seen the movie Avatar, the movie Avatar, I'm kind of a science fiction movie geek. And the movie Avatar, uh, the main character about halfway through the movie, what's his name? See, I haven't seen it in a couple years. I don't remember. But he goes, sometimes your whole life boils down to one badass moment. That's kind of how I felt about like giving up wood. I was just like, my whole life is boiling down to like one badass decision here right now. Because so, so, to, so to answer your question, um, I feel like wood housing is less of a stable decision. Sure, wood housing can be fine and you can live in it and heal in it, but it's more unpredictable. And two of the houses that we lived in went horribly bad after five months for the first one and one month for the second one. And so I just couldn't take the chance anymore. You know what it's like? Here's, the, here's an analogy for you. Um, we were already broke in terms of emotional and financial uh, reserves, if you will. So here's an analogy. If you go to the casino, because really living in wood housing is kind of like gambling. Uh, unless maybe like if you can find a log cabin that's 50 years old and still feels good, maybe it'll feel good forever, you know? 
But I never found that. I looked at log cabins. I looked at other stuff. I never really found that. I, I saw one house that was $750,000 that was old that felt good to me, but it wasn't even for sale. It was a friend of mine's house. And I was like, hey, if I paid you $750,000 right now, would you move out? And she was like, haha, no. And I also don't want to spend $750,000 right now. So anyway, we didn't really find the long-term house. But here's the analogy that I'll use for you. If you go into the casino and you just arrived and you have $500 to gamble away, uh, maybe you'll take some more risks in the beginning when you still have $450 left, right? You're like, oh, I'll just play some craps or blackjack or whatever. See, I know these analogies because I grew up in Tahoe. Tahoe has gambling. But when you get down to your last $10, you're like, I don't really want to take a risk right now because um, uh, what if I lose my last dollar? So that's where we were at when we chose to live in ATCs. Uh, to look to live in RVs for a time. I don't know if we'll be doing this forever. And and my family still has access to the house, you know. Um, and and you know we we have a house on our property. They we we can use it. They can they can you know sleep in it if they want to. I'm not telling them not to use the house. They can they we we have furniture in the house. You know it's set up. It's it's usable. Um, but but we do tend to spend a lot more time in the trailers in the ATC um, because um, we just feel better in it. So. Um, the analogy is if you are down to your last $10, which I felt like we were when we were um, finishing up with those two houses, because emotionally we were so at the end of our rope from all the moving and moldy houses and not seeing each other that I just needed a winning bet. There's the casino analogy. And I needed a winning bet for this season of our lives. I needed a winning bet. And so we decided to um, try to not have wood involved in our housing situation so that I could have a winning hand at poker. And I think a lot of people might benefit from that decision because there are people that I talk to that are financially devastated and they moved 20 times and they're still hoping miraculously that somehow the next apartment is going to be good. Like, why would it be? You know, modern apartments are built horribly cheaply. Now, if, if someone has access to a 30-year-old home that was built by a good builder and still feels good after all that time, then great. Maybe we'll do that one day. You know, I'm not ruling it out. I'm not even ruling out uh, living in the house on our property. It feels mostly okay to me. But I didn't want to be forced to do that. And so it really boils down to what you have left in your in your emotional or financial love tank, if you will, like your capacity. You know, we did not have capacity anymore. Even my, my wife pushed for it more than me. I was on my 10,000 mile road trip and she was, and I was like, honey, I think I found a house that feels pretty good. Like we should try to rent it or buy it. And she was like, no, she was like, I'm not doing that again. I'm not doing that again. It was harder on her than it was on me because I was the most reactive. So when we lived in a moldy house, I would move out and live in the driveway and she would have to take care of the kids. And I would just yell at her all day long about cross-contamination. She was like, I'm not doing that anymore. We're not living in wood anymore. So do you see what I'm saying? Like, it's not really a cut and dry answer about would you live in wood again? Or would you live in conventional housing? There's a lot of moving parts. What's your tolerance for risk? How stressed out are your kids? Do you want to move again? You know what I mean? Like, it's not just a simple answer. Okay, any other questions, guys? Um, so last question, it looks like here, and I hope that answered your question. Um, uh, but yeah, no, we have a house on our property and it's not a very bad house. And, you know, we sleep in it sometimes and it's, it's, you know, it's fine. Um, but, but we did not want to be forced to do that. So have your kids adapted to this lifestyle? Um, the biggest thing with kids, I think, is that the lifestyle is pretty easy in terms of um, giving up belongings and, you know, having to wear weird clothes and stuff. The hard part is friends. Kids need friends. So right when we were about to move into uh, a better city where we weren't so isolated from friends, that's when the coronavirus lockdown happened. And my wife and I say that we kind of got double whammied because uh, not only were we suffering from mold avoidance isolation, but we also were suffering from coronavirus lockdown isolation. So it has been really hard on my kids. Um, that's one of the reasons why I bought this property in Utah where we have two acres and now we have a trampoline and we have quads and we have a puppy. Cause I was like, all right, like now I just got a Mike Tyson knockout punch to the jaw here with like not only mold avoidance isolation, but also 
coronavirus lockdown. And so I was like, we just need something. We need like a place to camp out and have fun. Um, but yeah, I know it's the, the, the friendships and isolation part have been hard for me. And it's not because our friends are like contaminated or anything. It's just because a lot of the areas where mold avoiders do well are areas where there's just not a lot of like social things going on. But the place that we live now, my daughter goes to a dance class four times a week. She's a very high level dancer. She's going to do dancing competitions coming up here. And my son is a semi pro video gamer. And he has all of his friends online and they hoot and holler and laugh and joke in the garage. Um, that's his like his little man cave where he has his computer set up is in our cinder block garage. Um, and they have a great time. Now, I, now you know, I'm like, I wish my son had real friends and wasn't on online all the time. But a lot of normal kids, like a lot of his friends who are not mold avoiders, they're online a lot, too, because of coronavirus lockdown and because video gaming is like kind of the new thing. And a lot of people do it. And there's 20 million dollar video game tournaments. Now, my son has like a video that he just made on TikTok that has 100,000 likes. You know, so it's also kind of our culture. But, you know, I was just looking at pictures of my kids um, from before we left the mold house and they were sick. They looked horrible. So, you know, so um, I think my family now is at a point that as the coronavirus lockdown winds down, that we're going to be in a much better position to be making friends and having more stability, but that we just were in a place where we couldn't do that for a while. And um, it was hard, but we got through it. And, and also keep in mind that the first year and a half of mold avoidance that we did, we did nothing but have fun. I mean, we stayed at an RV park in Los Angeles, which felt great to me. Remember, don't try to make up rules. You're going to say, oh, Los Angeles is bad. Why is it bad? Do you really know that? Um, Los Angeles was fine for me. Even at times where I couldn't tolerate San Diego for 10 minutes, there were parts of Los Angeles that were fine. So we stayed at an RV park in Los Angeles for a total of six months of our first two years of mold avoidance. So let that sink in. I lived in Los Angeles at an RV park for a total of six months early in mold avoidance. This RV park was phenomenal. It had a pool. It had kids running around everywhere. It was close to Disneyland. So we got on the shuttle. We got Disneyland passes and, and the shuttle picked us up at our RV park. So we didn't have to drive and park and walk at Disneyland. We would just walk 150 feet from our RV to the Disneyland um, bus ramp. And then we would get on the bus and it would drop us off at the front door of Disneyland. We lived at Disneyland for the first year of mold avoidance. We lived there. I felt, I felt good at Disneyland. So we had a lot of fun. It was only when we moved to Taos and we did a year and a half in Taos that it really got lonely. But even in Taos, you know, my wife had a workout class. My kids did the ski program at the Taos Ski Resort, met a lot of other kids there. Uh, my daughter did high level gymnastics where she was at the point where she was going to her gymnastics class for three and a half hour classes, four times a week. And she went to a competition in Santa Fe uh, and, and did a, an amazing routine in front of a thousand people. And then the next weekend, the coronavirus lockdown hit and everybody was stuck at home. So. COVID and mold avoidance. Yeah, it's isolating, you know? All right, you guys, um, I'm going to just throw it out there to see if anyone has any last minute questions. I'll do one more question, but I think we covered a lot of really good topics. This video will be available. You can watch it. I'll post it to the timeline of the group. Um, just my normal little disclaimer that I'm not a doctor. I'm not a professional. I'm not a mold advisor. I'm just a guy. Um, the one advantage I did have in pursuing mold avoidance is that what I do for a living is I run an alternative medicine publishing company. I've published 25 books, written five myself, uh, that have sold over 50,000 copies. So I had a lot of um, uh, resources in the alternative medicine community to, to know that mold avoidance was the right way to go after I discovered it. And... Um, God really blessed us because the, the year that we started mold avoidance in fall of 2017, it was like the peak of my business. And, and I had, it was a really good time for us to leave and do mold avoidance on the road. And so, um, we, we were really blessed because of that. Um, I'm just testing my internet here said something. Okay. It's, it says it's, and see now look like I just got a notification on CNN that coronavirus is out of control again. And. Um, 
there's a second wave or third wave or whatever. And it, who knows, maybe there'll be more lockdowns. So uh, another podcast that I just made recently that you guys might want to check out is <clears throat> um, on my podcast. If you search any podcast app for Brian Rosner, you'll see this, my podcast. But I made an episode a little while ago that was about how to find private property to rent for doing mold avoidance. I think that's really important now because a lot of campgrounds are closed. And plus the federal government with their lockdowns is telling people stay at home, stay at home, stay at home. Well, what if you don't have a home? You know, what if you're doing mold avoidance? So I think that renting private property for mold avoidance, whether you live in it or park your RV in it, is a really good idea. <clears throat> and I have a whole podcast on some of the ways that I rented private property when I was doing mold avoidance. Any other questions, you guys? I kind of like doing this. And I still have three more sips of coffee. Any other questions, comments, what you guys are up to, where you're at, what you're doing, what your challenges are? Anybody else? I love this coffee. It's so good. Any other questions, guys? One last minute question. What's on your mind? You're watching a mold avoidance live video. You must be wondering some things about mold avoidance, right? Yet a mentor. Ask questions. I don't understand why people are not asking me more questions. There's 15 people watching right now. Nobody's asking questions. When I was in my phase of mold avoidance where I really needed mentors, Ask Simka, who's one of my mentors, how many questions I asked him. I wouldn't shut up. I, I, I was asking him questions all the time. I was begging him for to answer questions. So you guys need to ask more questions. I wonder how sick everybody is who's listening to this. Type in the comments how sick you are on a scale of 1 to 10. 10 being the most sick, 1 being the least sick. How sick are you right now on a scale of 1 to 10? 10 being the most sick, one being the least sick. See, what I kind of think is that we have a lot of people in our group now who really aren't that sick and they don't need to do extreme mold avoidance yet. So I think that's probably one of the reasons why people aren't asking as many questions because this is just like more Saturday morning entertainment to them than it is survival. You know what I mean? But I still have 15 people watching right now. Okay, so Paul Henry says he's eight on a scale of one to 10. All right, so yeah, that's that's pretty sick. Like that, that, you know, so yeah, doing mold avoidance, um, seven. Okay. Yeah. So you guys are listening and hearing stuff. You're just not asking me any questions. Um, <clears throat> yeah, see, I would say when I left my mold house, I was 10 and I'm not saying I'm sicker than you. My illness was worse. No, I'm not comparing, but like, whatever. I felt like I was a 10 anyway. And like when I heard about mold avoidance and I did my accidental sabbatical, it was an accidental sabbatical. I brought stuff with me. It wasn't perfect. Stop thinking you have to do mold avoidance perfectly to get benefit. But when I did my accidental sabbatical um, and I came back and I realized mold was my problem, I was gone yesterday. That's a figure of speech. You know, I was gone yesterday. That's how fast I got out. In the one month after I unmasked to mold in my house, I sold a car found a tenant for my house, moved a home-based business, bought a truck, bought an RV, um, got all new belongings for five people and was gone all in 30 days. I was like gone yesterday. So it is kind of perplexing to me sometimes that I talk to these people who are that six, seven, eight, nine, whatever number, and then they're not leaving. I'm like, maybe you're not a seven or eight or nine. Maybe you're like a four or five. Because trust me, when you hit a nine, for real, you are gone yesterday. There's some instinct that kicks in when you're that sick and you are just gone. It's like a, a fox stuck in a trap in the woods, you know, and he's stuck in a trap and his leg is bleeding and the trap is cutting into his muscle and his bone and there's predators prowling around him. If that trap opens, he's gone. That's how I felt. I felt like a fox stuck in a hunter's trap in the woods, bleeding out, knowing that I was going to die. Like it was, I had accepted it. I was sad about it, but I had accepted my own death. I had, I was mentally starting to envision what my family's life was going to be like when I was gone. And when that trap opened unexpectedly, I was gone yesterday. Like I was gone. Like I, one of the reasons why I wanted to get an RV 
was because, you know, I had young kids at the time and my wife and we were used to living in comfort. And in my mind, I pictured the inside of an RV and I was like, oh, there's a couch. Oh, there's a kitchen. Oh, there's a bathroom. Oh, there's bunk beds. Like this is a real house. I could like have my family in here and they would be comfortable. And actually, in fact, a lot of families do this on purpose. They go on family road trips across the country in an RV on purpose, even though they're not sick. I was like, I, I, I was like, this trailer has a little ball, a ball in front. And all I have to do is hook it up into the back of my truck. And like, I can move my whole house. I was like, damn. And that's why I bought a diesel truck. It's kind of funny. Like I went to the Dodge Ram dealership and they were like, here's the pros and cons of diesel versus gas. Right. And my truck is diesel. And obviously diesel can pull a lot more and is more reliable. And I was like, uh, bro, which one will help me be gone yesterday? And he's like, oh, if you're doing a lot of heavy towing and you're going up a lot of mountains and stuff, um, get the diesel. And I'm like, diesel it is. I'm gone yesterday. Like, get me the diesel engine. We've got important work to do. We're taking off. Like, we're, we've got important work to do. We're leaving. So that's why sometimes when people are like, I'm an eight or a nine of sickness, um, but I am not leaving. I'm like, you're not an eight or a nine yet. You will be, but you're not yet. And I don't say that with any judgment at all. I'm just saying that, like, you're not because you would be gone yesterday if you really were. Um, okay, I had a very bad brain issues. Better now, but I had to use navigation to get out of my neighborhood. Of, okay, who's talking about brain healing also dealing with no brains in the start? That's a really, really good question, Nancy. Um, okay, so that's a very common MT symptom. Um not remembering how to get out of your neighborhood, using navigation to get out of your neighborhood. That's like textbook MT symptom. What I will tell you is that if you can get to a clear enough location, you will probably notice miraculous brain functionality early on. And it will allow you to regroup and make a plan. Well, that doesn't mean you're going to heal right away early on. But if you can get to a clear enough location early on, your brain will heal and you'll be able to make a plan. And that's why we tell people, don't make big decisions when you live in mold. Um, I gotta blow my nose, excuse me. Don't make big decisions when you live in mold. That's why we tell people, low cost, low commitment experimentation. Go to a brand new construction hotel in the woods, an hour from your town, buy some new clothes at Walmart, take a shower, sleep for a few nights, and then think about your plan. Don't go spending $100,000 on a new house or on a new car or on a new RV when you're in mold and your brain doesn't work and you need navigation. Get out of your neighborhood. Now, the reason that I think I was able to do so much effective planning, even in a toxic environment, was the 10-pass ozone. I did some 10-pass ozone treatments, and I think they saved my life. I think I was too sick to even do mold avoidance. I really do. People may disagree, but that's what I think. Now, that doesn't mean the mold avoidance was any less important because even as I went on through healing, 10-pass ozone never allowed me to not do mold avoidance. It never even for 30 seconds replaced mold avoidance. But I think it cleaned me out enough that I could get my shit together. So, yeah, Nancy says, oh, yes, MT here for sure. Yeah, MT is just bad stuff, you know. That stuff is just so bad. MT really is probably like one of the roots of this illness. So, yeah, you know, gone yesterday was my slogan. Um, and I, you know, this morning, okay, you guys have any other questions? Anyone else who's watching, please shoot me some questions. Planning on a casita purchase. All right, I'll read your question in a second, Paul, but you guys ask me more questions. So, um, I was just looking at photos of my family this morning from late 2015. I think that's when my house got moldy. My, my house was already moldy and I had mild mold illness, but I was doing great. I, maybe I'll see, see if I can put some pictures up on the screen here for you guys. This is what I looked like late 2015. And this was before the really bad mold hit me. And I was still doing pretty fine, pretty much okay. All right, here we go. Pictures of what I looked like late 2015. There's probably a fancy way to like screen share on this computer. Can I do that? Uh, can I screen share? Stream? No. Broadcast, unpublish, polls, graphics, stream health, video clipping. Let's see. Let's try a poll. Question. 
How sick are you? Really sick? Not very sick. This is cool. Will this work? Polls ask your audience questions during a live video. Hmm. But why won't it let me publish it? How sick are you? Not published. Publish poll. All right. I just sent you guys a poll. Let's see what that. Let's see what that. Oh, and you can even show the results in the video. This is cool. There's a lot of other stuff I can do here. Video clipping, stream health, stream setup. All right. I don't see a way for me to share my screen. And I wouldn't want you guys to see my Fortnite up anyway. Um, okay. So anyway, I'm going to show you guys what I looked like in late 2015. Um, I don't know if you'll be able to see this or not. Uh, you probably can't. I was really healthy in late 2015. And here's another one. Kind of a, I would never normally show this publicly. This is November 2015. I was, I was fine. I mean, I was sick and like I had Lyme disease, but all the stuff in my books really, really helped me. So yeah, that's what I look like in November 2015. And I still, I don't know if I still look like that. Do you guys think so? Not quite. <laughs> Um, anyway, here's another one. This was my family, November 2015. That was before we had the really bad moon. So I think if the reason I bring that up is I think if people can just get out early enough, uh, then they can um do a lot better so if you are not that sick yet just don't let yourself get that sick i think there must have been some event in my house that caused me to get that sick that winter and and i didn't even feel it that's another reason why i don't trust houses because i think that the toxicity can really sneak up on you i really think the mold illness works by masking you and sneaking up on you and i really like having a trailer that doesn't really have any wood in it because there's not a lot of mold that can grow in it. I don't care how much cross-contamination it is. It's not as bad as active mold growth. Paul says, planning a casita to purchase currently a six-month wait. So trying to figure out my winter plans. Lots of restrictions because my son is dealing with critical health. It requires him to be close to his doctors. All I can do is stay clear of bad areas. Not easy due to marriage separation. Wife doesn't buy into the bad outdoor air. Mass cells soon off the charts. Constant flares feeling stuck between us. Yeah, Paul, I hear you. Um, I was very blessed in that when we started our mold avoidance journey, it was like the perfect time for us to go. My business was at the very top of its peak, but my business was already starting to slow down, so I didn't have any projects. Um, coronavirus had not hit yet. Um, my kids and my wife were excited about the idea of an RV trip. See, it was kind of smart to, to do an, a family RV trip as our mold avoidance, right? Because in an RV, you're just a normal traveler on vacation. I did that on purpose, you guys. I wanted our mold avoidance to just be a normal family on vacation because I could think ahead and see that mold avoidance was gonna be hard on my family. And so I said, I'm gonna help my family by making this into an RV vacation. And that's what it was for the first year and a half. It was an RV vacation. We stayed in cool spots. We didn't have any bills at home because we didn't have a house payment because we rented out our house. Off the wall question, but I need to know. It involves a loved one. Did you ever experience sundowning with dementia? Ho ho! Sundowning, baby. Yeah, baby. I had dementia when I had really bad mold illness in my house. Can you believe that? I can't even say it now. I'm like, did I? Because now I feel like I freaking, I do not have dementia, baby. Like, I, my brain is on now. Lisa once told me that the reason she did mold avoidance was to get her brain back. And she was like, I did it. I got my brain back. And that's how I feel. Like, I still, you know, whatever, I'm not in perfect health, but I feel like I totally got my brain back. But anyway, I know what sundowners is because I had it. And I thought I was an Alzheimer's patient. This brings back so many horrible memories, you guys. I hope nobody ever has to experience this. But sundowners is where... People with Alzheimer's and dementia 
when the sun goes down, their symptoms get a lot worse. And when you're in a nursing home and all of the Alzheimer's nursing patients freak out and go crazy and have an exacerbation of symptoms right when the sun goes down, it's called sundowners. How do I know that? Aren't you guys impressed that I know that? Someone asks about sundowner syndrome. I know that. I did have that. And it was there. When, when Eric describes this, when the sun goes down, there's an ionophore shift and all the biome, the plants and the microbes and the mold and everything kind of like freaks out and changes because there's a huge change. The ultraviolet light goes away. There's a big temperature shift. There's big there's an ion exchange. You can ask Eric. Eric knows a lot about this. And even up to about eight months into mold avoidance, I once stayed at this RV park. It was really kind of a bad RV park, but I felt okay there in the daytime. And right when the sun goes went down, I would go freaking crazy. And I would get dementia symptoms and freak out. But I talked to my mentors about that. And they said, oh, yeah, that's a mold illness phenomenon. Go to a clear location. And sure enough, I went to a clear location and it stopped. That really helped me psychologically to realize that it wasn't my brain that was the problem. It was the environment that was the problem. And after that, uh, it happened to me a couple of other times in other locations where the sun would go down. And now this is totally different than frat because frat is a super toxin that also acts up at night. So that's also another thing. Frat is the worst from about sundown to about two in the morning. And it's also because of one of those ion shifting things. That's one of the ways you can identify frat is if you have a toxin flare up that happens at sundown, it might be frat, but it might also be other mold toxins. But I have not had that in years. So that's actually kind of miraculous that I cured my own sundowners syndrome with mold avoidance, right? Like miracles with mold avoidance don't surprise me anymore. I'm like, huh, that was just a miracle. Eh, who cares? Like that's how amazing mold avoidance is, that you don't even talk about miracles anymore. That was a miracle. That was another miracle. I don't care. Whatever. But yes, I did experience sundowners. And I feel so bad for all those Alzheimer's patients who are locked up in moldy buildings and don't know what's wrong with them. And they have these sundown symptoms at sunset and they're like, you know, condemned to mental institutions. Like, how horrible is that? That's why I was gone yesterday. I mean, probably the best thing about mold avoidance is getting myself back. You know, you get to a certain point where you're so sick and you lose yourself. You go to the ER and the doctors look at you crazy and you have nowhere else to go because the ER is the only, like I lost myself in, I think I, what I experienced when I was the sickest was worse than dying. I would have committed suicide in my last year of illness if I didn't have kids. I just couldn't do it to my kids. I laid in bed and I just put my arms out and I was like, I hope I die, but I never could kill myself because I had kids and a wife. And I was just like, I'm not going to do it. Can't do it. But I think that what I experienced was worse than death. Because to have those horrible symptoms, I went to the ER six times in six weeks in my in my very sickest in uh, fall of 2016. I went to the ER six times in six weeks. And and I and I got transferred to a to a specialized hospital because some of my immune system markers were off and I had a huge cut on my foot and I had tetanus, tetanus, the, tet the tetanus toxin is horrible, you guys, horrible. You guys know how people die of tetanus, the old, the old fashioned illness, tetanus, tetanus, the infection is actually not very dangerous, but it produces a neurotoxin that, um, uh, it makes all of your muscles tense up. And the way people die of tetanus is actually that they have involuntary muscle contractions throughout their whole body and the involuntary muscle contractions around their chest and their rib cage crushes their lungs until they asphyxiate. How effed up is that? Like I was getting that. A doctor was like, wait, you're waking up in the middle of the night and you're having uncontrollable back arching. He was like, that's tetanus, man. I'm transferring you to a specialist hospital. And then they shot me up with all these human blood products that could have had you know, been contaminated with HIV or something. And I'm laying there and saying goodbye to my family. And like, people are like, how can you be happy doing mold avoidance? Man, your life is so limited. And I'm like, you were not 
That's sick. Because if you were, and you could get your dignity back, your life back, your self back, your independence back, life is good, bro. Like, life is good, you know? Like, and I still have my family that's lonely and needs friends, and we're working on that. I'm not giving up on that. Um, but you are not a 10. Don't tell me that you are as sick as a 10 unless you were laying in the hospital with dementia, begging for suicide, begging for death, lost every ounce of your person and your dignity to dementia. You can feel your brain slipping away and you don't know what to do about it and you and you are so horrified by your symptoms that you think that God must be a cruel jerk. Which I don't think that because I'm a Christian and I actually could talk about that another time. But that's what I thought at the time. Don't tell me you're a 10. Don't do it. You're not a 10. Sorry, I'm getting a little bit heated here. But you're not a 10. Unless you can tell me that that happened to you. At my sickest, when the doctors thought that I had tetanus in my foot, they couldn't even see any signs of infection because tetanus is a very minor infection. But the tetanus toxin occupies the tissue around the cut. I had a podiatrist, a foot doctor, who was very generous to me, and she knew that I was suffering, and I asked her to cut my foot off because I thought it might help me feel better. I was willing to have them cut my foot off because I thought that the tetanus toxins in my foot were doing this to me, and they probably were. A doctor actually diagnosed me with low-grade tetanus. And she said, I won't cut your foot off, but I'm thinking about digging out a lot of the tissue and bone around your foot and doing a major surgery on your foot to see if it helps you. Dude. That's messed up. First of all, it probably wouldn't have helped me because it was a systemic problem. My body became so vulnerable to tetanus that I went. I was walking in the woods one day when I was really sick and I ran into barbed wire and I got all these cuts on my leg and my tetanus came back and I would wake up in the middle of the night and my back would arch involuntarily and it would constrict the breathing in my lungs and I couldn't breathe and I would go to the ER. And that's when the doctor was like, yeah, you probably do have tetanus. He's like, we haven't seen this. I'm transferring you. They obviously thought that I had it because he transferred me with a diagnosis of tetanus to a specialist hospital. And they were like, we can't do anything for you. Once we've given you the tetanus vaccine and the tetanus immunoglobulin, there's nothing we can do. So I don't like specialist hospitals with rare diseases where there's nothing they can do saying goodbye to my family. Like that's a 10, bro. Mental illness is a 10. I had severe mental illness when I was very mold sick. I had a panic attack that lasted four months from the mold. And this was not like, oh, I have trauma. I was sexually abused. And I don't mean to offend anyone, but I never had that. I had a great childhood. I had no trauma. I was, I was happy as a clam. I did not have emotional trauma. All right. Like my life was freaking awesome. And I was totally loving my life. And I had no trauma and I was never abused and I didn't have an alcoholic dad. And I had a panic attack that lasted months. And I forgot what my kids' faces looked like. I, my dementia was so bad that my kids would have play dates with friends and they would come over and I wouldn't be able to tell which one was my kid. Like, I can't even, I don't even want to talk about this. I, this is make this is, this. I'm getting really, really stressed. And now I have trauma because I don't want to think about that. So let's move on. But like, don't tell me that you're a 10. If you're a 10, sick, like talk to some people who were actually a 10 and see what they did when they found out they had mold. Talk to Simka. You know, I think it did take Simka like a month to plan his exit, but see if he ever considered sitting around in his mold house just a little bit longer. Okay, I'm commuting half an hour sleeping. Can you post about mold, about dementia? My husband works for a lady that has bad mold and bad dementia, and her son has MS. They won't listen to me. Angela, yeah. Mold, MS, and 
So my grandma died of Alzheimer's disease. My dad, thank God, is very healthy, but he does have mild mold illness that I don't think he will acknowledge. Can you post about mold dementia? No, I won't post about that. Well, no, I'll post about it. I don't want to talk about it, though. It's too traumatic for me. People are going to have to get that information from somewhere else. If I go down the deep, dark rabbit trail of remembering how gone I was, I start to shake in trauma. <laughs> like, I'm traumatized now. People are like, it's funny, you know? People don't understand. They're like, I don't know. People just don't get it. They're, they're like, they're like, isn't mold avoidance traumatizing? I'm like, no. Having dementia is traumatizing, you know? Oh, what a crazy sucks. Yeah. yeah, and I'm not saying I know I know some people have trauma and they're like, you know. But I I do not me there's a couple mold avoiders who see eye to eye on me on this. I do not like talking about childhood trauma in relation to mold illness because it cheapens and downgrades the authenticity of the physical aspects of mold illness. And we already have enough psychologists telling us that we're crazy. And we already have enough family members telling us that we just need to deal with our stress. And we already have enough people questioning our illness. So no, I will not talk about childhood trauma as related to mold illness. I don't necessarily dispute it, but I'm not the guy to talk about that. I had a picture perfect childhood. I had a great adult life. I married a beautiful, wonderful, amazing woman. I have great kids. I made good money. I lived in paradise. I do not have childhood trauma. I have great parents and I don't want to talk about how somebody got sexually abused and that made them have mold illness. Not me. I got sick as a dog with very healthy emotions. Now, that doesn't mean that mold didn't affect my emotions. I think mold caused me to be codependent in friendships and insecure. Mold, mold's a neurotoxin. Like, it's going to mess up your brain. But it's cause and effect. Cause and effect. Yeah, so, okay. Uh, we're going to have to end this video on a happy note. So someone talk to me about something. What else are we going to talk about? What are we going to end this video on? This has been a long coffee, right? Hour and a half we're at here. Hmm. Let's see what the poll results are. How do we look at the poll results? Oh, uh, yeah. So, yeah, I don't know how to do the poll results. It says there's an active poll, but I don't see how to find what the answer is that everybody said. That's the whole point of the freaking poll is to show you guys the results of the answers. But where is it? It's not showing me. Create a poll, polls, polling, this. Oh, there it is. Is that, oh, okay. Show results in video. You guys seeing this? Really sick, four people, 67%. Two people, not very sick. Okay, so, so, so the answer is that two thirds of people say they're really sick and one third of people say they're not very sick. Okay, great. Everybody's welcome. You're even welcome here if you're not sick. You should educate yourself. Um, yeah, there we go. So the poll results are, are in. Okay, so I'm going to tell you guys why I am okay with the fact that I just totally stressed myself out thinking about how sick I used to be. I'm going to tell you guys why I am okay with that. The reason that I am okay with talking about how sick I was, even though I'm going to have a bad hour now because I am i haven't really re honestly remembered that in a long time, that I couldn't remember my kids' faces and I was laying in a hospital bed and there was they were about to chop my foot off because they didn't know what else to do. like, And I, and I was in a panic attack and suicidal for over a year. I'm going to tell you why I'm okay with that. Because first of all, when this video is over, I'm going to go on a quad ride and play with my puppy and just get out of this mind state of thinking about how sick I was. But the other reason why I'm okay with it is because without the memory 
of how sick I was, mold avoidance would seem really crazy. It would seem too extreme to do mold avoidance if I really wasn't that sick. I think that the brain has a defense mechanism where it forgets bad stuff. It's the brain smart. It's like, dude, we're going to just forget about that. So I'm actually okay with the fact that I just reminded myself of those horror stories because I feel better about my mold avoidance now. I think that I am a walking miracle. Like that last two years of how sick I was and how far gone my brain was, the thought that I had every day when I was that sick was, are you kidding me? How can it be this bad? Every day, I had that thought, are you kidding me? How can I be this sick? So it's good to remember that. It's good to remember. It's like why we study the Holocaust. Why do we teach our kids about the Holocaust? Why? Why is it beneficial to talk about something as horrible as the Holocaust? Why? Because we need to remember. Because by remembering and by exposing our kids to that horror, hopefully they will make better choices when they're grown up and it's their turn to be in charge of the world. Mold avoidance is not a light topic. It is a very heavy topic. <sighs> yes, we do not want to repeat it. So that's why when I go back to a bad location and there's MT, I should leave. Because I remember. That's why if we ever get a tyrannical leader like Hitler again, we should kick his ass out of office. And I'm not, I'm not talking about the, that, sorry, that could have been implied that I'm like making a political video about Trump or something. I actually really don't care much about politics at all. And I don't really care who wins the election. So I wasn't referring to current events, but if we ever get another Hitler in, in any country in the world, we, we will remember. Okay. Gosh, I'm really enjoying this. You guys, it's been an hour and 40 minutes and I'm still on. Um, I think one of the reasons why I like doing this with you guys, even though there's only eight people here, gosh, back in the day when I was an alternative medicine journalist, I gave a presentation once to 500 people live on stage. Uh, but mold avoiders have a lot of emotions and things to process, you know? I mean, cancer patients, when they come back from near death, everyone knows about their trauma and how hard it was. And there's Count cancer counselors and family, but mold avoiders don't get any of that. You know, we we walk back from death and fight society and do everything on our own. And I don't know. It's crazy. It's horrible. It's horrible that our loved ones who are the, the most, I have loved ones that are great people who never understood or supported me with mold illness. And I don't even blame them. They just had no clue. So, I don't know. Some, I'm reading a comment here. Yeah, so there's someone in here, Susan Kimmel's talking about past trauma plays into our emotional ability to respond to physical. Yeah, some people have this past trauma that somehow connects to their mold avoidance. That's not me. All right. The only trauma I have is from those last two years of being sick. Before that, even when I had Lyme disease and I was using a lot of treatments to keep myself stable, I was very happy and very stable and had no trauma and nothing. And I led church Bible studies and felt good and mountain biked my ass off and had great friends. I don't have a lot of trauma. Trauma didn't make me sick. Let's just put it that way. But I, I respect you guys. You know what I'm saying? Like. I, 
I respect that some people have more trauma than me, but I don't. And I don't want to talk about my trauma because I don't have a lot of trauma except from being very, very sick. Like I, I don't, I spend my days now very mentally healthy. I have very good mental health now. I'm happy. I'm peaceful. I'm joyful. I'm calm. I'm engaged with my kids. I enjoy my life. I want to do good for people. I feel like, I feel like, and Simka has said this, you guys, I feel like mold kind of gets mixed up in the brain and messes with our trauma processing capacity. But like getting rid of the mold out of my brain was my trauma detox. Does that make sense? I don't, I, I don't have problems now in my mind anymore. I don't. But I do respect you guys who, who have trauma and need to process it. I'm just the wrong guy to talk to about that. Because what I want to do is bring light to the physical devastation that mold illness causes. And I'm convinced that probably a lot of reasons why people have so much trauma and hold on to their trauma is that they have mold toxicity. I think that chicken and egg, mold came first and trauma came second. But I still acknowledge that, like, you know, people have trauma from getting, like, I never had a hard childhood. I had a great, I have a great family and a great marriage and great kids. I, I don't have a hard life. But I'm glad. See, I want to have that story. I want to be able to tell people if they say, oh, you just need to do brain retraining because you have trauma. I want to be able to say, no, I don't. I was working four full-time jobs and leading at my church, and I was fine when I got <clears throat> mold sick mold sickness got in my way any trauma while having mold makes it ramped up yes messes with trauma processing i just want you guys to know that i respect you guys i don't think that 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 sexual abuse as a kid or something is a small topic and i'm not writing it off <clears throat> i'm just not i don't know anything about that that's all i ptsa i don't think it has anything to do with becoming ill it might have had something to do with how Hard I push to deny that I was sick. I'm stronger because of it. Yeah, see, I don't I don't know any of this stuff. You, but yeah, I respect you guys though. I, I you shouldn't watch this live video to talk about trauma. It's I don't I don't know. I don't know. I'm a very mentally healthy person as long as I'm physically healthy. But I have great parents. Great parents. I have the best parents in the world. My parents are so awesome. My parents are just amazing people. That's parent. I could. I wouldn't change a thing about my parents, even if I could. All right, you guys. We are pushing an hour and forty-two minutes. I want to thank everybody who watches. I think we covered some really great stuff in this video. I'm going to post this video onto the group timeline so you can rewind it or share it or tag people on it. Um, I think that this was a great video. I think we covered a lot of stuff. We processed a lot of stuff. We covered a lot of logistical stuff. We covered a little bit about emotions and trauma. Um, <clears throat> thank you guys for tuning in. Um, I'm just grateful to be alive. I, I love my life. I, I'm happy. I'm a great. I'm. I, I do well. You know, people don't know how great it is to be healthy after you've been so sick, and so they're like, "How can you be happy living in an RV?" You know, whatever. I'm like, well, I just can. All right, guys, I hope you guys have a wonderful day. Thanks so much for tuning in. It was a great time. Um, and we'll see you on the group. Disclaimer, I am not a doctor. <clears throat> I am a healthcare journalist. And if you need medical advice, talk to a real doctor. See you later.